Thank you for joining us today, and in my study, we're going to be focusing upon the subject in this presentation, the most controversial subject in Bible prophecy. There is one subject in Bible prophecy, at least among scholars and those who have devoted their life to eschatology and theological studies, but in that world of Christian academia, there is one subject that is oftentimes considered to be the most controversial subject in Bible prophecy. And because I've had some questions recently that revolved around uh, this subject, I felt led to devote an entire Bible study uh, just to this subject. As I often say, I, I would like to become a trusted voice in your life for not only understanding the Holy Scriptures. As you know, we uh, on this platform, we deal with many, many questions that you, our audience, send in. Uh, the bulk of our content is driven by questions that you, the audience, send in to us. And many times those questions uh, related to Bible subjects are hot potatoes and difficult and, and hard to answer, and uh, I do my best. But I would like to be a trusted voice in your life for understanding the Holy Scriptures as well as Bible prophecy. And as we begin, I also want to say that I sincerely appreciate uh, not just your desire, but your discipline to be a serious student of the Bible. Uh, and if this is your very first time, because uh, we're finding out that uh, somewhere between seven and 10,000 uh, new people every month are becoming a part of a growing community, uh, which I am being told, uh, if you're listening, this particular social media platform is becoming one of the largest social media platforms for Bible study. And, uh, and by that, we have almost a million views each and every month, some months more, some months less, and growing. But if you're joining us today for the first time, I want to extend an invitation to you. Thank you for being part of one of the largest Bible studies in global and digital outreach, and I hope you'll be a faithful part. Uh, be sure to subscribe, and we uh, drop brand new content almost every single week on Friday. And so as you begin with me today, if you're a brand new student to begin your educational journey with us, uh, just get a, a Bible. If you don't know which Bible to get, I just did a, a study on five translations of the Bible that I recommend that are considered to be the most accurate translations of the Bible. So if you're a brand new believer or you're a, a searcher and you're, you're, you're walking through, maybe you've not made your commitment to Christ yet, but if you need a recommendation as to what is an accurate, trustworthy Bible, there's a study on this channel just for that. But all you need to be a part of our worldwide Bible study is a Bible, a way of taking systematic notes, whether you want to do that on a legal pad or a, a digital device, a tablet, an iPad, that's up to you. But I do encourage you to get a highlighter, and as we study together uh, in the weeks and months and perhaps years ahead, highlight some of these classic passages, and I'll do my best uh, to walk through the Scriptures with you. So our study today is the most controversial subject in all of Bible prophecy, and I want you to go to Revelation chapter 20. We're going to begin reading there. As always, we start in the Bible, we stay in the Bible, we finish in the Bible. Uh, this is not a light channel. This is not a, a channel for the casual. This is not a channel that produces content for people that want everything done in three minutes. We are not a biblical drive through for lazy uh, people. We are a dedicated uh, classroom of the Bible for those who want to learn the scriptures through proper biblical interpretation. Revelation chapter 20, let's begin at verse 1. I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation in our uh, content. If you haven't listened to it yet, uh, listen to the five most accurate translations of the Bible. Uh, the New Living Translation is in that list of five. Uh, many people ask me why I teach and preach out of it so often, 
And the reason for that, it is often described as the most readable accurate translation, as well as the easiest translation for brand new Christians to understand. And since my first target audience is unsaved people and brand new Christians, I often study out of it. Verse 1, Revelation 20, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He sees the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. Pause right there. As you study Bible prophecy, and in particular the book of Revelation, you will find references in the book of Revelation to the dragon. And people will ask, who is the dragon in the book of Revelation? Well, if you continue to read, many times the Bible and books of the Bible will explain exactly what some of these mysteries are. And we find that here in verse 2. He sees the dragon, which we will find reference to in the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation 13, when the unholy trinity is introduced for the first time, the dragon who is Satan, the first beast is the Antichrist, the second beast is the false prophet, and his people are brand new students of the Bible and learning. Uh, they see some of these words, and that's the obvious question. Who is the dragon? Well, we're told right in the infancy of the vision of the book of Revelation who the dragon is. He sees the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, full description, leaves no wiggle room for who the dragon is. It is Satan, that fallen angel, Lucifer, that uh, God created as the most magnificent musical angel in worship in heaven, who led that revolt against God and was cast out of heaven. Verse 3, it goes on to say, the angel threw him into the bottomless pit which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted the mark on their forehead or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. When the thousand years comes to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog. In every corner of the earth, he will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore. Again, our subject today, we're devoting our time focused on what is the most controversial subject in Bible prophecy. And as always, before we get into the meat of our Bible study, I like to take time to pray and to pray for you. Heavenly Father, once again, as we bow before you, we thank you for life and health and strength Everything we have comes from your gracious hand, and we give you praise. As we open up the Bible, as I prayed earlier this morning, only the Holy Spirit is the perfect and pure and flawless teacher. But you said you gave us the Spirit to guide us into all truth. I pray that you would lead us and guide us today as we walk through some of these difficult things that many ask about, I pray for every single listener and the thousands of people in the days and weeks and months ahead who will listen to this time. I pray specifically for their salvation. Don't let one person, whoever listens to this preacher and teacher, be left behind. 
I pray that they'll all have a desire to live ready to meet the Lord. And I pray that you'll help me to introduce them to the one who died on the cross, your only begotten Son. The blood that was shed washes every sin away. I pray for that one who might be listening, who feels their past and their sins are too numerous and that God could never love them or forgive them. May they feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit and your arms of compassion in our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. By the way, as always, if you're a new student, at the very end of our time together in the moments ahead, if you're not right with the Lord, I'd like to close in prayer, specifically praying to help you make peace with God. There's nothing more important in all of the world than living ready to meet the Lord. Of what value is it if you study the Bible with me and become a student of Scripture and seriously begin to look into the things of God and the chronology of Bible prophecy and so forth if you're not living ready to meet the Lord when He comes? So if you're not sure as to where you stand with God in the moments to come when I close, I'm going to pray specifically for you and so can I humbly ask you to have the patience to stick with us until the very end. Today could be a day that will change your life forever as so many hundreds of thousands of people through the ministries of Lost Lamb could equally testify. As we begin, I've always been transparent uh, with people and with our students and all of our social media platforms. I openly and quickly admit to you that not all scholars and not all Christians agree on the specific chronology of the final events of Bible prophecy. But you need to remember that there are varying views, and the people that hold these varying views are as devout in their love for Christ and for the Scriptures as you are and I am. And, uh, but there are variances on what is called secondary doctrine. Now, if you're wondering what in the world is secondary doctrine, well, as you study the Bible, there is what is called primary doctrine or fundamental doctrine, and it's impossible to say, I am a Christian, if you don't even believe fundamental or primary doctrine. For example, fundamental doctrine would be the doctrine of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. That's a non-negotiable. Another fundamental doctrine would be the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Another fundamental doctrine would be salvation through Christ alone. The Bible is unbending. There is no room for debate. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation through Christ alone is a fundamental doctrine, and I don't have time to exercise and to go down the long list of fundamental doctrines. But those are doctrinal hills that you die on. There is no debate. It is impossible to say, I am a Bible-believing Christian, and not hold firm to fundamental doctrine. It's secondary doctrines that there can be variances on, but it doesn't mean somebody's unsaved, or a reprobate, or a, a heretic. Now let me give you some examples of secondary doctrine. For example, when it comes to the working of the Holy Spirit, there is debate. Not everybody agrees. For example, some would say that the gift of God in the language of prayer, often called the baptism in the Holy Spirit, some would say that that ended with the death of the apostles, that there is no longer the ability to pray and to receive a heavenly language as they had clearly seen in the, in the book of Acts. And I have teaching on this. If you're new to our channel, I have entire uh, teachings available on understanding the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and so on. Another secondary doctrine that some would disagree on is divine healing. Some would say that uh, the, the, the healing and the miracles uh, died with the apostles. These who hold that view are oftentimes called, if you're taking notes, cessationists, and uh, because they believe it ceased. And so in the doctrinal world, they're called cessationists. 
And some believe that miracles and healings are no longer available to the modern church, that that died off with the apostles. The apostles, I would strongly disagree. I have seen people that have received healings and miracles in my own life, in my family's life. I, and many of you that are listening to me have received a miracle touch from God. So uh, all I'm saying is there are hot potato issues in secondary doctrines and obviously in Bible prophecy there are several varying views on the chronology of Bible prophecy. But I want you to listen carefully to me. All who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, regardless, don't miss this, and some of you need to put this in your notes because perhaps you've not had or have never been taught what is the proper attitude for a Christ-like believer in these matters. Uh, everybody that disagrees with us on the Bible, are, are we to uh, insult them and, and, and defame them and call them stupid and you know, a lot of people in the body of Christ are incredibly rude with other members of the body of Christ. So I want to give you the biblical golden rule when it comes to the body of Christ. Anyone who has truly received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, regardless of their denominational bent, regardless of your denominational bent, should be treated with respect because they are ultimately your brothers and sisters in Christ. And biblically, we all make up the bride of Christ. Has anybody ever told you that some of these people that you've been calling idiots and stupid and there's only one way of interpreting, and, and you, you, you ignorantly insult the full body of Christ, do you realize you're going to spend eternity with those people? They're the bride of Christ. And so if you're going to be a student uh, of my ministry, I want to be sure you understand something. I hold the greatest respect for the body of Christ. And there are people that are friends of mine that we uh, strongly disagree on some secondary doctrine. But they're friends. They're a part of the bride of Christ. And we, sh we should have open, I say this at the Bible college and seminary all the time, Christians should always welcome open, vigorous, academic debate. But when the dust of debate settles, we must always respect and revere other believers and the body of Christ. And so, uh, as I've stated, we're about to tackle one of the subjects that Many scholars, in fact, probably the vast majority of eschatology scholars, eschatology, if you're not familiar with it, that's a theological term that simply means people who study Bible prophecy, the study of eschatology and end time events, final Bible prophecy, and so on, often focused on the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, First and Second Thessalonians, and, and so on. But in the high level of scholarship in eschatology, uh, the majority of them, the vast majority of them would say what I'm about to show you is the most controversial subject in Bible prophecy. And what is it? Let me give it to you right up front. It is the discussion of the chronology of what the Bible calls the millennium. And I have entire Bible studies available on the millennium. So if that's a new word to you or you're a brand new believer and you're wondering what in the world is the millennium, uh, take advantage of the content that we have. By the way, uh, probably uh, the best source, if you're listening through uh, our podcast channel, if you're listening uh, to our Facebook uh, videos archived, uh, if you're listening to YouTube channel, probably... Uh, the number one way of studying with me that I would recommend is our YouTube channel. And then second to that, I would recommend that you follow our podcast channel if you want to be a part of this uh, incredible global audience that gets together every week and uh, studies the scriptures as we're doing right now. The reason why I recommend the YouTube channel is because you have both the audio and the visual. 
Uh, the podcast provides the same content. It's divided up a little differently in editing, but you only have the audio. But a lot of people like that for when they're traveling. They, they listen to the podcast as they're driving to work or home or truck drivers that drive cross country, etc. But become a student with us and be sure to subscribe to the channels. And there are all kinds of subjects available. So uh, I'm not going to take time to go through a Bible study on the millennium because we have that content already available. For sake of time, uh, mille uh, in the original means a, a thousand. And so the millennium refers to that thousand year period that I just read to you in Revelation chapter 20. But if you're taking notes, be sure you get this. All Bible-believing Christians, though there may be controversy and, and varying views on the chronology of Bible prophecy, all Bible-believing Christians agree on the fundamental doctrine of eschatology or Bible prophecy, which is what? Let me give it to you, and some of you may want to write it down. All Bible-believing Christians can agree on one major theme, and I'll read this again, one major theme in Bible prophecy, and that is this. In the end, King Jesus will establish His eternal kingdom here on earth, and He will rule and reign forever, and of His kingdom there shall be no end. I wrote that down word for word. It is solid gold. I want to give it to you a second time. And if you don't get it all in this second time, you can hit pause and rewind until you write it down. But I would highly suggest, if you're a serious student of the Bible, this is the golden theme of all Bible prophecy, of all eschatology, that all fundamentally agree upon. All Bible-believing Christians can agree on one major theme in end-time prophecy, and that is this. In the end, King Jesus will establish His eternal kingdom here on earth, and He will rule and reign forever, and of His kingdom there will be no end. Now, I'm speaking today on the most controversial subject in Bible prophecy, as we've already covered. It is the discussion of the millennium. There are three major views held in eschatology uh, that are hotly debated. I'll give them to you. I'm not going to go into depth on this study because, once again, I already have content that deals with these in detail. There's probably two or three hours of teaching available just on these three views. And I'm not going to take the two to three hours uh, to go over it here, just letting you know it's available. If you're taking notes, the three major views on the millennium, number one is called the amillennial view. A-M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L. -L -L -E amillennial millennial view. And they simply believe that the millennium began with the first advent of Christ and that Satan was bound at Christ's first coming and that it will end at the second coming of Christ. They don't believe in a literal thousand years. They translate that that God just simply meant it's going to be a long time. So that in, in one sentence, and there's volumes on the subject. So if you'll allow me just for the students of the Bible who are taking notes in one sentence, that's the amillennial view. Number two is what is called the post-millennial view. I've already spelled millennial. Post is P-O-S-T. The post-millennial view believes in a progressive, what I describe as a progressive improvement of conditions on this earth as the end draws near, culminating in a golden age over which the world is totally Christianized and that Christ rules and reigns in a nutshell. And again, there's volumes in, in libraries and seminaries and Bible colleges on the subject. But again, if you'll allow me, just one quick 
a summation of that view. And then the third view is the pre-millennial view. And uh, as we walk through the study, I will tell you right up front, uh, this is what I strongly believe in. I, I actually don't um, wrestle, and, and again, this is not in any way condescending. I'm just being transparent with you. If you're asking me, you know, how certain are you, how strong are you on the premillennial view uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10. I strongly believe that the weight of scholarship rests upon the premillennial view, and so let's walk through that, and then I'll close with four reasons why I feel the premillennial view uh, stands on top of all others. It's important to note that premillennialism is, uh, and don't, don't miss this, premillennialism was the view of the first century church fathers. In the infancy of the church, beginning at the first century, they only had one view. There, there were not three views at that time being debated in the early church. There was just the pre-millennial view. And the pre-millennial view was the doctrine not only taught by the early church, it was taught by the early church as the only view for over 300 years years. Uh, and so uh, if you're wondering what did the church fathers believe, uh, for 300 years they, they never wavered. And after almost 50 years of being a dedicated student of the Bible and Bible prophecy and eschatology and end time events, I am strongly convinced and uh, I just want to be transparent, put the cards on the table, if you're asking me, and this is my opinion, and as I've already stated, there are others who have other opinions uh, in the body of Christ whom I respect, and brothers and sisters in Christ who perhaps would take a different position. I'm just telling you, and then I will conclude our study by giving you four reasons why I have no doubt on, on this view. Uh, the premillennial view, in essence, believes that, uh, let me give it to you in a nutshell, and because I already have teaching on this, again, uh, pardon me for walking through some really important teaching, but I already have teaching on this, and I do my best to keep these Bible studies somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour. Uh, in the days ahead, I may even try to go to a model of 30 minutes to 45 minutes, but most of my students who write to me uh, say, I enjoy the Bible study, and how can someone say they're a serious student of the Bible that sits down at night and watches three hours of Netflix or uh, you know, three hours of football or, or whatever, and uh, they only have five minutes to give to God to study the Bible? Well, I, I agree with you, and those are the types of students uh, that typically are attracted to our content, people uh, that genuinely want to sit down and be taught the Scriptures and learn the Scriptures. And uh, so the premillennial view, in essence, believes there will be an increase in apostasy as the church age draws to a close. Well, isn't that what we're seeing? They also believe that the eminent prophecy, the next major prophecy on God's calendar, is an event called the rapture of the church. Again, I have a tremendous amount of content on that. If, if you've never heard of the rapture of the church, you're sitting there thinking, what in the world is the rapture of the church? In the Bible, it's actually uh, in our English Bibles. Uh, again, remember, the original uh, manuscripts were not in English, and uh, King James was not the author uh, of the Bible. The original manuscripts were Old Testament Hebrew, also Aramaic in the New Testament, primarily Greek. And so uh, all accurate translations of the Bible have to go all the way back to original manuscripts and carefully and meticulously translate from Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. So in our English Bible, uh, in Thessalonians, the rapture is referred to as being caught up. But in the Latin Bible, it's the word raptus, which is where we get the word rapture from. So 
just very quickly, if you're wondering why you can't find the word rapture in your Bible, it means the same thing. It, it refers to the catching up of the believers prior to the tribulation period. And so premillennialists believe that in the last days there will be an apostasy in the world, also into the church, that the next major prophetic event on the calendar of God is the rapture, that the rapture is followed by seven years of tribulation, and that after the tribulation we have the second coming of Christ here upon the earth. After the second coming we have the millennium, which I'm talking about in our study today. And again, uh, if, let me just slow down long enough. If you're taking notes, write this down. Uh, because you need a good, if you're a new student, you need a good basic definition for the millennium. Let me, let me give you one. The millennium, if you're taking notes, write it down. The millennium is a literal, literal 1,000 year reign of Christ here on the earth where Satan is bound. That, if I were teaching at the Bible college or seminary, would probably be where I would begin in my first sentence in a lecture. The millennium is a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ here on earth where Satan is bound. So there's one very concise sentence that will help you to understand what the millennium is. I would, uh, I would challenge you to memorize that. After the millennium, Satan will be loose, the Bible tells us, for a brief time. After that, the great white throne judgment. After that, the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. And after that, the eternal unending kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, along with all who have been washed in his precious blood and received salvation by faith alone. So, Again, if you want to go back and you want to write all of that chronology down, that, in essence, is the chronology of what premillennialism teaches. So let me close our study today. Four biblical reasons for the premillennial view. Because the natural question that many students of eschatology ask is, if there are three views that are debated on the end time subject of the millennium, how can you know what is right? And as with all uh, study of scripture and things that are uh, controversial and debated, you have to back up and understand the total narrative of scripture and then by the full weight of scripture, make your decision. In other words, you don't make a doctrinal decision based on one verse. Nor do you make a doctrinal, dogmatic view based upon a chapter. Nor do you make a doctrine based upon a single book. You look at the total narrative of the scripture. What does all of the Bible, there's 66 books in the Bible, all doctrine has to pass the test of all 66 examinations. All 66 books must be in agreement. It is not a biblical doctrine unless the entirety of the Bible brings its spot of agreement upon that. Uh, I will tell you this, and again this is not meant to be um, condescending, but of the three views on the millennium, the amillennial view, the postmillennial view, the premillennial view, by far and this is not just my opinion, many notable scholars would agree, by far the weakest position is post-millennial. That is the weakest of the three, and you'll see why as we conclude. Uh, let me give you a couple of reasons why as, as long as we're there. First of all, uh, if you were to ask me just, you know, give me a couple of ideas as to why you would say that, because I'm sure there's probably going to be some individuals listening to me that you know, maybe you've been taught a post-millennial position, as I stated earlier. Uh, we may not agree on secondary doctrine, but if you're a true brother and sister in Christ, I love you, respect you. Uh, you will never hear me say your view is stupid or, you know, I, I, I think that's, I think that's the, the platform of the unlettered and the unintelligent. Uh, when somebody disagrees with you just to start attacking them and criticizing them and trying to lower them, I don't think that's what intelligent people 
do. And, and as Christians, I think there must be uh, a more gracious attitude. But first of all, the post-millennial view was not even considered until the 17th century. So the fact that the post-millennial view didn't even make it to the debate table until the 17th century, uh, its extremely late arrival to the table of debate is a fundamental uh, weakness. Uh, the second reason that I would give you is that the main theme of the post-millennial view is that the world would be progressively taken over by the church, and that the kingdom of God would begin to progressively and ultimately take over the world until the entire world is Christianized. So after World War II, this view began to uh, lose a lot of emphasis because a lot of scholarship, you, you can't pr not only prove it, it seems that the opposite is true. Uh, after World War II, it became obvious the world is not becoming progressively more and more Christian. The world is becoming more and more progressively wicked. And the same could be said for my home country, which I love. I love our country. I pray for our country. But I am not going to pull punches on this. As a student, not only of the Bible, but of American history, I don't know how any serious student of American history reads American history and doesn't see our nation, America, is becoming progressively more and more wicked. And if you don't see that, you must be living off-grid somewhere and haven't read a newspaper in, in decades. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've seen, but there is no place for the Christian viewpoint in the political world, in the educational world, by and large, our world is becoming reprobate. And so uh, the post-millennial view has lost uh, an incredible amount of wind in its sails. And, and again, I want to say this graciously, but at the table of debate, there are very few scholars that sit there and make an argument for the post-millennial view. Some, and again, if they're brothers and uh, sisters in Christ, uh, we love them and respect them. I'm just telling you that of the three views, it is the weakest and uh, it has the fewest notable proponents. Uh, let me close by giving you these four. If you're taking notes, write these down. Number one, the date of the premillennial view. I'm giving you four, not all, but I'm giving you four of of the main reasons why I believe strongly in the premillennial view. The premillennial view, as I've already stated, was the earliest view and only view of the first century church. So again, if you're taking notes, we're closing with four reasons why we strongly hold to the premillennial view. Number one, the date of the premillennial view. The earliest view, the only view in the church for hundreds of years was the premillennial view. From all the writings, all the manuscripts, all of the records of our early church fathers, the premillennial view was the only view in the infancy of the church and uncontested. The second reason that I'll give you as we bring this study to a close is the binding of Satan. Well, what do you mean by the binding of Satan? Well, if you go into your Bible into uh, Revelation chapter 20, we read uh, in Revelation chapter 20 that at the very beginning of the millennium that Satan is bound. And uh, again, Satan being bound, this is problematic. And it's not only problematic for the post-millennial mill view, it is problematic for the amillennial view. And let me explain why. Both of these views, the amillennial view, the postmillennial view, both of these other two views on the millennium contend that Satan is bound at the first coming of Christ. Not at the beginning of the millennium. They both teach and hold the view that Satan was bound, that that was fulfilled by the first 
coming of Christ and that Satan, by their view, is bound now. Uh, however, that seriously, that view that Satan was bound at the first advent of Christ, meaning in this present age he is still bound, uh, runs into I don't know how many hurdles, numerous hurdles in the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, Satan is called the ruler of this world. He is called the God of this world. He is called an angel of light. He is called the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is called like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is mentioned in the New Testament as the devil who schemes against believers, hinders us, accuses us, and binds the minds of the lost. And so much more is stated in the New Testament about the wicked and open activities of Satan that are obviously in our world still in full throttle. So for both the amillennial view and the postmillennial view, this is a major theological hurdle. Why? Well, I think by now you know the obvious. Satan is anything but bound today. I love what one theologian that I read uh, in my library stated. I, I wrote it down, brought it to the study today. He said, if Satan is bound today, he must have an awfully long chain. <laughs> if Satan is bound today, he must have an awfully long chain. Uh, thirdly, uh, in reasons why the strength and the weight of scholarship, I believe, rests upon the premillennial view, is the literal use of numbers. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7, it specifically mentions 1,000 years six times, literally. I had that question asked of me of a, a film producer yesterday that has only been saved for just a couple of weeks. And at lunch, he asked me the question as a new believer, a film producer out of Sweden, uh, he said, I just have given my heart to the Lord. I just bought a Bible days ago. And should I take the Bible literally or figuratively? That's a great question. I probably should do a Bible study just on that because I think that is a common uh, question that many people have. When the Bible, and again, I can't do a Bible study on it now, but let me give you a nutshell. When the Bible is literal, you should take it literally. When the Bible is figurative, it usually lets you know in open verbiage that it's figurative. In other words, you'll see passages like a mighty rushing wind. Uh, and I could go down a, a litany of, of where the Bible uses open figurative language. But the thousand years as the length of, of the millennium is mentioned repeatedly and literally. And you have to ask your, yourself a question. John, the author of the book of Revelation, why would he repeat something six times and always in literal context if he wasn't trying to be literal? Moreover, uh, most, if not all, of the other specific time periods in the book of Revelation can be interpreted literally. Uh, ten days is mentioned in chapter 2, verse 10 of the book of Revelation, literally. 144,000 uh, raised up out of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of each. It's literal in chapter 7, chapter 14. Uh, five months is given to us in the book of Revelation, literally in the ninth chapter. 200 million, speaking of an end time army, uh, whether it's the kings of the east and China alone or a coalition that China is a part of, that army that will come against Israel is spoken of literally. 200 million men. 42 months exactly mentioned in chapter 11, verse 2, and 13, uh, Revelation 13, verse 5. 1260 days mentioned literally, Revelation 11 and 3, and Revelation 12 and 6, and so on. So when the Bible is literal, take it literally. 
When the Bible is figurative, it gives you clues that it is figurative. Additionally, when John mentions a time that is general or nonspecific, he identifies it by such phrases like a little longer in chapter 6, verse 11, and a little time in chapter 12, verse time. So John the author, when he's literal, take it literally. When he's figurative, take it figuratively. So you can't say, if you're a student of the Bible, take everything literal. Nor can you say, take everything figurative, because the Bible does say things that should be interpreted and are spoken and identified as literal, take it literal. But when the Bible gives it to you in figurative, figurative terms, then you must interpret it figuratively. So if the thousand years symbolizes a long while, as the amillennial view teaches, as the postmillennial view teaches, then why didn't John say so? Why did he six times always refer to it as a literal 1,000 years? The specific and nonspecific numbers used in the same context point towards a literal understanding of a 1,000 years. There is no, don't miss this, there is no indication in the proper interpretation and exegesis of Revelation chapter 20 that anything other than a literal time period of a thousand years is intended here. Lastly, and I close with this number four, the flow and the sequence of reading. The flow and the sequence of reading in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, it's the only passage, don't miss this, the only passage in the Bible that specifically mentions the 1,000-year reign of Christ, and it is followed immediately after the second coming of Christ. Uh, the second coming of Christ, of course, is in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 12. The author of the book of Revelation, John's repeated use of the words, Then I saw 32 times in the book of Revelation moves the action along in what I see as an obvious chronological sequence as John is seeing new visions. The millennium follows the return of Christ in the sequence of events that John is seeing unfold. Uh, again, if you're taking notes, don't forget what I've taught you in the past. The outline of the book of Revelation is found in the first chapter and the 19th verse, where he writes, write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. So in the very beginning of the book of Revelation, we are also shown a sequential reading, a sequential outline. And if you have your highlighter, highlight Revelation 119 and make a note. Revelation 119 is the biblical outline given to us by John. And let me tell you what that outline is. Uh, well, it's, it's just straight out of the passage. He said, the things that you have seen, again, Revelation 119, the things which you have seen, that's chapter 1. John writes down the things that he saw in chapter 1. Then in Revelation 1.19, it says the things which are now happening. John writes down the things that were now happening in his framework in Revelation 2 and 3. And then in Revelation 1.19, the third part of the outline of the book of Revelation, the things that will happen. And John, in the Revelation vision, from chapters 4 all the way to chapter 22, the end of the book, John writes down the things that will happen. So you can't bypass that. It, it's not a commentary or a scholar giving, giving us an outline of Revelation. It's Jesus giving John, who's writing the book, the very outline that Christ gives. And so uh, this is one of those gold nuggets of Bible prophecy. Be sure to write it down. Be sure to memorize it. Be sure to get it into your spirit. Uh, maybe write it even in your Bible, uh, right there at the very beginning page of the book of Revelation in your Bible. 
write down somewhere in, in, in a space, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19 is the outline of the book of Revelation given to us by Christ, written down by John. The things which you have seen, chapter 1, the things which are now, chapters 2 and 3, and the things that will happen thereafter, foretelling prophetic events, Revelation chapter 4 through Revelation chapter 22. So Jesus gave John this revelation in what can only be seen and what is obviously divine, uh, defined by Revelation 119 as a progressive, systematic order of events. And so when we read and interpret the book of Revelation and its chronology, we do so by the same flow as Christ gave the vision to John. So in conclusion, the premillennial view, as I've stated earlier, and uh, again, the title of our teaching today, the most controversial subject in Bible prophecy. There are others who are going to disagree. And the three main views, as you've learned today in conclusion, the amillennial view, the postmillennial view, the premillennial view, and as I have given you four substantial reasons why I believe the weight of biblical scholarship rests upon the premillennial view. And with that said, I believe because of that, the next major event is the rapture of the church. There are zero prophecies in this Bible, zero prophecies in this Bible that have to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. In an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. It is the next major prophetic event that will take place, the rapture of the church. It will be followed by seven years of tribulation. As you've seen in my teaching on the five political agendas of Bible prophecy, in that seven-year tribulation period, there will be a one-world leader, the Antichrist, a one-world order, a one-world monetary system, the mark of the beast, there will be a one-world religion, and there will be a one-world military power or force that will enforce the vicious, brutal, barbaric mandates of that one-world government. I close with one question. Are you living ready to meet the Lord? I say it all the time. Who cares if you are perfect in your understanding of the Bible and Bible prophecy if you don't even know the author of the book. The reason for the book is not just to amass intellect and spiritual understanding and, and, and be able to sit at the table of doctrinal debate and prevail. That's not the reason for studying the scripture. Your study of the Bible should always be wrapped in humility with you being the student and the Holy Spirit being the teacher the ultimate teacher. Now God has given five gifts to the church in Ephesians 4. The Bible speaks of the office of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. Gifts given to the church to guide us through the scriptures. But the bottom line is do you have a clear memory in your life of a time when you've done three things? But the Bible teaches me that if you're going to genuinely live ready to meet the Lord, you have to do three things. Number one, you have to recognize that you're a sinner, which takes humility. Number two, you have to repent of your sins. Jesus said in Luke 13, unless you repent, you will perish, you will face judgment. The first message of Jesus was repent. The last message of Jesus was repent. You have to recognize sin, repent of sin, and thirdly, you have to receive Christ. If you're not right with God, if you're not living in victory over sin, but sin is living in victory over you, can I pray with you as we close? And I'm not here to judge you or to condemn you. I'm here to help you. I genuinely want you to live ready to meet the Lord because we are living in the final moments of human history. You need to be able to lay your head to the pillow and know every night if Jesus were to come tonight or I were to take my last breath before the sun comes up. My heart is right with God. I've placed my faith in Christ and I'm living ready. If you're not sure of that, pray with me right now. And when we're done praying, 
I want you to go to the website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org, and be sure to type one word, lostlamb.org, because if you type lost with a space in lamb, it's going to take you to lamb.org, and that's not me. Lostlamb.org, and contact me. Just let me know. Write me an email, uh, text, however, call the office. Just let me know. Say, Tiff, I prayed that prayer with you, and I'm sincere. And we'll do everything in our power here at Lost Lamb Association to help you to begin your journey in faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I believe you were speaking to me. I ask you today, as I recognize my sin, and in childlike faith I now repent, cleanse me, forgive me, with the blood you shed on the cross. Wash my mind, my body, and my spirit and make me holy in your eyes. This day I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And I vow I will serve you all the days of my life. In place of my weakness, give me your strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power to follow after you and to learn your eternal word. I will never again be the same, for today I belong to Jesus and you belong to me. And it's in your name I pray. Amen and amen.